Good morning. I am Chris Bushart, the uh, CEO of Corn LP, an ethanol plant up in Goldfield, Iowa. And this morning I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our first panel. We are going to have a, a, a carbon uh, round table this morning. You can't pick up a paper or look at any news uh, recently without seeing something about carbon reduction um, in the headlines. And we could not have a summit without addressing this issue. So this morning, we've got a, a panel up here that we're gonna talk about uh, carbon reduction from several different levels. Um, one of the key, this is, we feel, one of the key um, pieces of the biofuels future is our, our carbon footprint and being able to reduce that even more than we are today. That's gonna take work from our farms to our plants, but the path to carbon negative is right here before us. So we're gonna bring each of our panelists up uh, one at a time. We're gonna start here at the farm level. Marshall McDaniel, an assistant professor at the uh, agronomy department at, at Iowa State, has been studying ways to reduce carbon at the plant level. So we'll bring Marshall up to uh, introduce our first topic. Great, can you all hear me okay with my mask on in the back? Super, I'm used to talking about to a student class about the tenth size of this conference. So thank you to Lisa and Monty that invited me. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I see as a potential and a glass is half full. Um, I think this is my slide advancer. Let's see if it works here. Maybe not. Okay, can I signal to somebody slide advance? Oh, not, oh yeah, can we go back one, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, so my name is Marshall McDaniel. I'm assistant professor in the agronomy department at Iowa State University. And my specialty is in soil fertility, soil health, and agronomy. Um, and the, I've been doing research for six years at Iowa State, but I've had a career for over 15 years in studying soil plant interactions is kind of the technical term of it. If you have any questions that I don't get to, you can email me at marsh at iastate.edu or you can see some of the cool research that's going on in my lab, mostly done by my uh, fantastic students and postdocs by following us on at soil underscore plant underscore IXNS, which is just is short for interactions. So soils and plants are in a give and take relationship and this, my lab focuses on understanding this relationship and enhancing, thank you, um, in, enhancing this give and take to improve soil health and make agriculture more productive and environmentally sustainable. Cool, this one works. Um, and I want to get up to you and talk to you and show you some data here to give you a bit of a context of what's going on and why we hear so much about soil health and carbon and, and the ability of Iowa soils and, and soils around the world to store more carbon. So this is a set of data, and I promise this is the only graph I'll show you. I only have a couple more slides. This is the only graph. So this is a study we did. The cardinal red um, go cyclones. The cardinal red is uh, a native grassland soil, meaning it's never been plowed, never been tile drained. That's probably what our maximum capacity is by nature, right? And then in the, the gold hatched bars is kind of average practice, not all farms are like this, but the average practice and where soil carbon is. And this is, and the units are in megagrams of carbon per hectare. That's a metric ton, one megagram. And you can see these are actually um, 11 different studies um, ranging from Arkansas, many from Minnesota, uh, uh, Iowa, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, and they measured it to soil carbon to different depths too. But if we look across all of those, and I put the number that um, each of those studies showed cropland was a percentage of the native grassland or the, the potential. And I don't mean to be, get up here and sound doom and gloom. I look at this as a glass is half full. This is potential I see for farmers to increase soil carbon on their farms with the right management practices and um, kind of an un tapped potential. So I'm more of an optimist. I look at that as half full. And even though we've got a gap to close, and I think about yield gaps as well, and many of you have heard about a yield gap, I like to also think of the soil organic matter or soil carbon gap. And I see that um, 
this as the, uh, the gap that we can also be closing with yield production gaps. Okay, so these are the practices that will get us there, and they all fall under five soil health principles, and I borrow this from the NRCS. Uh, this is an all-inclusive. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a study I did where we um, did a little bit more uh, that didn't fall under these categories, but soil armor, minimizing disturbance, increasing plant diversity, continual live plant root, sometimes called perenniality, and livestock integration. And these are the practices that fall under that. So cover crops, retaining residue, reduced tillage, CRP or prairie strips, conservation reserve program, um, lowering compaction. And you can see some of these practices cover more than one principle. CRP or prairie strips, uh, plant diversity, cover crop mixtures, crop rotations, intercropping, CRP prairie strips, um, a, having a continual live plant root, uh, perennial crops like a new crop called Kernza, which is a perennial wheat crop, um, using other perennial biomass or biofuel crops is also a potential. And then also reintegrating livestock onto the farm has been shown to increase soil health and, and carbon. And, and so that might be grazing cover crops, seeding a pasture into rotation and a longer term rotation, or adding manure. We know we see a lot of evidence of benefits to that too. Okay, I'm gonna just wrap it up with a couple of quick things. I wanna talk about one project my research group has done with REG. There's probably some REG folks out here. I know they're a sponsor. This was a really neat project. And what we did is we looked at a um, byproduct of the uh, biodiesel production process. And so I'm showing it at the farm level, we produce soybeans, then that goes to REG to produce biodiesel. So out of 100 gallons, um, every 10 gallons, uh, or for every 100 gallons of um, uh, uh, biodiesel production or the, the feed stock, we produce 10% of it goes to a byproduct called glycerin. And, and it costs money and you can refine it. I know I'm speaking to the choir, many of, the, many of you on this. Um, and it can be used in cosmetics or used for uh, uh, pig feed or even uh, food products. But it, it's costly and it's an inefficient use of it. So what we did is we uh, worked with REG to apply that glycerol, glycerin, back onto farm soils and it actually reduced nitrate leaching, it increased biological activity in the soil and I'm, I'm just bringing this up and we haven't published this research yet, it, my master's student has it in uh, Iowa State's archives, I'm happy to share it with you. But this is one kind of novel or, or integrative way I think that we, in addition to those um, soil health promoting practices, we can uh, make farms more sustainable. And so I just want to wrap up with this kind of vision I see of Iowa in the future. So the, the sunlight beams kind of show the past uh, or the present 2030. I know it's hard to see in the sunbeam and then the future 2050. And I see renewable fuels, diverse crops, uh, improved water quality, sh uh, shored up banks. We see uh, people fishing in the streams, um, having some renewable energy like solar panels, uh, using biogas and other uh, new technologies to make Iowa a beautiful, productive place for all of us to live. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Jessica Hoffman. Jessica is the Regulatory and Compliance Manager at RPMG. Her main focus is to ensure ethanol plants are complying with state, federal, and international programs such as the uh, Federal Renewable Fuel Standard and the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Also ensuring that plants get the proper credit when they adopt practices and technologies to reduce emissions. So Jessica will come forward and discuss some of these technologies and how they can be employed at the plant level. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Even without a mask, I can be a challenge to hear, so uh, <laughs> give me a wave if it's too hard. As Chris said, I am with RPMG, a renewable products marketing group. And I came down from Minnesota. This is my southern vacation, so thanks for the invite. 
Uh, RPMG is a Minnesota-based ethanol and co-products marketing company. We were established in 1996, and we have a successful track record and strong history uh, with advantage over our competition. We have been producing and marketing our core products for over 25 years, and we plan on a solid future ahead. Our market presence includes over 2 billion gallons of ethanol, 2.2 tons, uh, million tons of distiller's grain, and 450 million pounds annually of corn oil. And in 2020, we were very proud to add two new product lines to our business, High Purity and USP Grade Alcohol, and Alti Pro, uh, and a 50% protein product used in animal feed. So where do I fit into this matrix? As Chris indicated, I've been with RPMG for 15 years. And on any given day, you can uh, find me speaking with state and other regulatory agencies, including the EPA, and really championing and being a cheerleader for our industry, but also leading my team through navigating regulatory and uh, other requirements from customers, and help us to find opportunities while maintaining compliance in the markets that we serve. This means that I'm not a technology provider. I'm not an engineer. But we do see a lot of energy products from a very macro monitoring level. And when Monty asked me to speak today, I said, sure, why not? And then I realized that we'd have to follow the governor's speech today. And while that was a little bit daunting, uh, it's a great opportunity to be here and share with you all. So. There are a lot of exciting ideas that we read about in the paper and that we're presented with. And I think, yeah, it works. So where do we put our focus? Because really, the possibilities are endless. And the problem is not a limit of options. It's where do we focus? And we just heard from Marshall uh, covering farm practices. And this is really here just to illustrate for us what the makeup of a plant CI score is and where it comes from. And outside of farm practices and indirect land use change, which we as individuals really cannot tackle, that's going to take regulatory and policy work, the biggest driver, the biggest lever that a plant has at their disposal is energy consumption. And you can look at that as either electricity consumption which is roughly, give or take, 6% of your overall CI score. Or today, in most cases, natural gas consumption, which is right around that 25 to 27% range. So how do we get at that? How do we really drive those numbers down? And I know it sounds really obvious, but as human beings, we sometimes overlook the obvious. And do not discount de-bottlenecking and other high efficiency projects at your facilities. Those are going to be key. And they also are going to translate into new markets outside of fuel or other alternative fuels that our products may ultimately be used for. Other great alternatives that we hear a lot about are renewable natural gas or biogas. And this makes a lot of sense where it's prevalently available and easy to access, but it can also be very costly to implement, and there's a lot of competition. Renewable natural gas can also be used as a transportation fuel on its own, and they also benefit from RINs and low CI scores, and they have a high demand in those marketplaces. So we have to be able to compete in those spaces. We also are seeing more and more interest or technology providers coming to show their wares on renewable energy or electricity being used to create process heat and cogen at facilities. And this is some really exciting news and areas that we will continue to look toward in the future. But again, don't overlook what you are able to control or impact today, because all of the decisions that we're making at our plants today are certainly going to uh, impact us tomorrow. Incremental changes matter, and they do add up. Now, beyond these technology changes, there's also new and innovative uses for our products. And that can translate into things like sustainable aviation fuel 
or even applications in diesel engines. And I know I personally was very encouraged to hear John Deere's uh, exciting news around Christmas time to implement a partnership with Clear Flame and to possibly see the use of ethanol in our farms for different applications there in heavy duty equipment. And I know that we're gonna hear a lot about carbon capture use and sequestration today and also discuss it as part of our panel. I did uh, fail to mention that we will have a Q&A portion once we're done. So we've got, uh, a mic well, we'll have mics here on each of, of the aisles. So if you've got a question, write it down. I've got a few questions, but we'll have a, a, a portion to ask uh, any one of our panelists um, to expand a little bit more on, on these topics. So up next with us, we have uh, Dave Slade. Dave is the Executive Director of the Biofuels Technology and Serv of Biofuels Technology and Services at Renewable Energy Group, REG. And he will discuss why it is vital for policymakers to stop uh, ignoring the role that biofuels play in reducing carbon today. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Marshall and Jessica. So this builds nicely on what Jessica just said about incremental change or improving things now. Um, so this is some ideas that we've come up with to help communicate the urgency of the situation and also what biofuels can do to help. So I'm going to dive right in. And unlike Marshall, I apologize. I have a lot of graphs to show. I'm going to go through them fast. They all build on each other, though. So if you have the luxury of looking at the slides later, hopefully it all makes sense at that point. But the thesis here, the idea is that fuel, petroleum fuel, is a top contributor to GHG emissions. This is in the form of carbon dioxide from fossil carbon. So fossil CO2, you may hear me say over and over again, fossil carbon. Those emissions accumulate in the atmosphere. They do not go away. Many accounting schemes treat it as if you have an emission set in one year and then you move on to the next year. Well, in reality, that fossil CO2 stays in the atmosphere for decades. That's not being accounted for currently in many com companies and organizations and governments' plans for how to mitigate our problem here. Plus, as we already acknowledged, Monty's repeated many times correctly, our current administration is focused on electric vehicles at the expense of all things. So as we focus on future, we're missing an opportunity to act now, and we're continuing to emit fossil carbon into the atmosphere, increasing the content of our atmospheric CO2. So biofuel is a simple step to do something today, and I'm going to show you how to quantify the value of acting today. So what can we do now? I mentioned earlier that annual accounting seems to be the dominant mindset. People think of their emissions as an annual event. They, they emit so many tons of CO2 that year, and then they move on to the next year. And really, it accumulates and continues to impact climate and, and that greenhouse gas effect that we've all learned about happens based on how much extra carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. So we're very used to thinking this way about cumulative impacts of small changes, but thinking about retirement. Everyone has been taught from teenage years to save for retirement, small amounts early, save early, and it accumulates over time. The exact same analogy works for fossil CO2 emissions. If we can reduce them today, even by smaller amounts, the impact accumulates over time, the positive impact in this case, right? So avoiding emissions early and often helps to dramatically improve our overall climate impact. And I'm gonna show you how to quantify that here. So it's not hard math, it's Excel, but it's just basically algebra, but you have to add things up. So this is the annual emissions mindset. This is saying, okay, if I emit one ton a year of CO2, fossil CO2 every year, then this is what it looks like on my climate impact. My y-axis here, the left side is how I'm impacting the climate. In reality, though, that's not how it works. It's not 10 tons of impact after 10 years of one ton per year. It really looks like this, because my first ton sticks around for a long time. It's up in the atmosphere for decades. This shows a reasonable decline rate based on expert client scientists in Europe and what they came up with for carbon decay in the atmosphere. So what we have is first year sticks around for 10 years, second year's emission sticks around for 10 years. Those boxes, those numbers at the top of each of those bars, that is the total impact in that year of my emissions starting in day zero, starting today. I'm ignoring, we can ignore what we've done so far. The past is the past, we can't change it. Starting today, what are we doing? That's what this is helping to quantify. And you can see over 10 years, if I emit one ton per year, my actual climate impact is the equivalent of 50 tons, or 50 ton years, 44.9, if I round up to 50. So 45 tons of impact, not 10 tons of impact per year. So, this gives us a new framework for how to compare our decisions, 
how to compare our options. So I use the term cumulative carbon impact to refer to what's the cumulative effect of your carbon emissions, fossil carbon emissions starting today, and then cumulative benefit is how much better can you do with small changes or large changes versus that baseline. So here's an example. The gray bars with the hatch marks are, I stop, I stop all my fossil carbon emissions in 2026, okay? So in my mind, I'm perfect in 2026. Now that doesn't exi exist, there's no option to do that really, but for argument's sake, we're throwing out the best possible option here. So stop entirely halfway through my decade. By the end of the decade, I've only done 28% reduction in what I had done for my baseline. That's not, that's great, but it's not as great as 100%. It's not what people think it is. So this is a way to quantify that cumulative impact each year, really. You can see there's zero impact in year one. By year 2026, I have a very small cumulative impact because I have five years of all my full fossil carbon emissions behind me. So taking that mindset and applying it, just to a couple examples. The gray bars here, the gray, the gray line, that is the same example I just showed. 100% reduction in 2026. I become perfect, magically perfect in 2026, but in 2021, I'm still emitting my full ton per year. Or I could just do something where next year, which is actually now this year, 2022, I cut my emissions by 45%. Not 100%, 45%. But you can see the cumulative benefit of that 45% reduction in fossil carbon emissions outpaces my perfect every year through the end of the decade and beyond, and that doesn't stop me from doing more. My green bar is just... Uh, my green line is just the same 45% reduction every year. We can always do more. So that's just to show that you can outpace any perfection by doing something now, even if it's not as perfect as people want to think it could be. So this is our problem we have with the current environmental focus on electric vehicles, is they're ignoring what we can do now. They're ignoring the damage that's being done while we wait. This is a way to quantify it and tell people that there is value here. So that's the math. And then the ideas that I think help us make these arguments are, first of all, we, as biofuel producers, farmers, people generating these options right now, we need to embrace this urgency. Tell people it's important. Agree with them. It is. It's critically important, and we need to reduce carbon now. We don't need to wait for perfection. We need to do it today. This is an emergency. If this is truly a climate emergency, as, as President Biden has said, well, verifiable reality should trump everything. We know if we burn biofuels, we're not emitting fossil carbon. Every gallon of biofuel that we use is non-fossil carbon. Therefore, we're not increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over what it was last year. So that's direct and measurable. Even if we want to go full life cycle analysis and say, fine, we'll, we'll account for all the energy in our production, that's still verifiable. What's not verifiable is ILUC. Okay, imaginary land use change is not verifiable. If people want to continue to use it to oppose the use of biofuels, they need to prove that it's real. It's been around for 15 years now as a concept. There ought to be plenty of time to prove that it's real. If it can't be proven real, it needs to be neglected. So one way you can help with this is don't include ILUC estimates when you start to account for the carbon intensity of your products. It's imaginary, it hasn't been proven yet that I've seen. And finally, we need people to understand that this isn't about some grand perfect solution that we engage in and, and finally get there 20 years from now, as Monty said. It's about what we can do now. What can we do today? And what can we do in small increments? Because doing something now is better than doing something later, and it all adds up, and we can communicate that message. I look forward to questions later. Thank you. Okay, up next we have Stefan Mueller, the principal economist at the University of Chicago, Illinois. Stefan's been with us uh, at prior summits before, and we're, we're thankful to have him back uh, this year. In the past, he's talked about um, some, of the, uh, some of the issues with the gasoline supply. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the, the life cycle of transportation fuels. Uh, Stefan has been just recently on a committee for the National Academies of Science Committee on current methods for doing life, life cycle analysis for low carbon transportation fuels. Welcome, Stefan. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. I'll have some um, slides prepared. A little bit of a harder time reading it from here, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, so about a, a year and a half ago, you know, I decided to get much more heavily involved in also electric vehicle modeling. You know, we've traditionally been modeling biofuels um, um, and comparing it to gasoline, but about a year and a half, we expanded our model here at UIC to also really include electric vehicles. We're obviously, obviously uh, pulling a lot from existing models, especially grid model. Uh, in our modeling, but I feel like um, sort of expanding our view a little bit of 
getting a little bit deeper into different ethanol blends um, that, than other models. And so on, on this graph, we use the, the metric gram CO2 per mile. Um, you know, when you do this comparative analysis, the, the most common comparisons are either, either done on a gram CO2 per mile or gram CO2 per megajoule, and you might know both of those units. Um, here we switched everything to grams per megajoule, uh, grams per mile. And so on the left-hand side, you can see gasoline is about 450 uh, grams of CO2 per mile. And then um, E10 is lower because of the gasoline, uh, because of the ethanol in there. And then an electric vehicle, you know, an electric vehicle charged on a, on a grid, on a, on a grams per mile, ranges um, throughout all of those uh, blue bars that are listed from much lower than gasoline to, if you had a coal-only grid, higher than gasoline emissions on a grams per mile, which in, in areas like India, China, Japan, that is important, right? There's a lot of regions that rely heavily on coal, and even our Midwestern grid is still heavily coal-reliant. Um, and then you see all the, the yellow bars are the biofuels options, you know, from mid-level blend, high-octane, low-carbon fuels, uh, to E85 with CCS, carbon capture is, is coming uh, likely here. And you can see just how competitive these are. And I want to keep this in mind, right? Ethanol technologies, even on a one-to-one -one basis, under many configurations, are competitive with uh, electric vehicles from a greenhouse gas uh, perspective. Because it depends on where you charge uh, the electric vehicle and when you charge it whether you're on a marginal grid or you're charging a base load during the night or you have to tax the next marginal power plant. And it's not only me saying that, right? So I pulled out this uh, publication from 2016 and, uh, uh, you know, on the, the, uh, the columns are the gasoline vehicles and the rows are uh, some sort of battery technologies. And what I want to point out is the red areas here really show you that in those areas, According to that publication, not, not my, my saying, but also my saying, um, the, uh, the electric vehicles are not competitive with, competit with the conventional engines. So it's a 2016 publication, and we know since then, you know, some coal plant plants have retired, so it might look just slightly different, but not by much, and coal-powered uh, retirement has significantly um, slowed down. Electric vehicles also depend a lot on the driving cycle that we're doing. Right? For urban driving cycle, you can see um, the, the bars to the, the sections on the right, these are urban driving cycles where the conventional vehicle, the black bar, is higher. But for the highway driving cycle, which is also the rural driving cycle, um, that's misspelled on that slide on the, on the wording on the left, so listen to my words. So um, the, the advantage is not as high, right? They're right in line with electric vehicles. So, uh, driving modes matter um, as well. And then impact of seasonality, you might have seen this slide, for example, in Iowa, right, in northern climates where we have relatively cold, cold winters, during the winters, electric vehicles are just not, not as efficient, right? And, and, you know, you can see that E15 in some of the winter months is, 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 is cleaner than some of the, some of the electric uh, vehicle technologies, and that's because of we, we, we apply a different energy uh, economy ratio to, to winter months here, then electric vehicles are not as efficient, and um, that's where the picture um, arises here. And then obviously, um, we have to think about, and, and was alluded to earlier on here, the, the, the vehicle volumes, right? We've done two studies here, actually several runs of this model that we have now here at, at UIC that we run, and one was for Iowa, introducing E15. Um, and then, on, you know, we showed basically, because there's so many cars that can utilize E15, right? The power is in volume of the cars. Even if you're, if you're not, you know, if you're competitive with EVs, but, but not quite, the sheer number of cars you can implement this technology in the legacy fleet gives you much better results. Uh, another study we've done was for the Next Generation Fuels Act, um, where we modeled 16 million vehicles of, uh, of dedicated high-octane, low-carbon fuels vehicles coming in by 2026 for the following 10 years, ramping up to 160 million vehicle totals were significant, uh, as in 2 billion, 2 billion metric tons greenhouse gas savings by 2040, is what we showed in this research brief. And that's, that's available. 
Um, also worked with Brian West, who, uh, who presented some of this data um, at, the, uh, at the recent SAE uh, workshop. And there we, we ran yet another scenario and compared it against a, a proposed Biden bill uh, that looked at aggressive EV development. And we showed if we switched half of the legacy vehicles um, to an E20, mid-level ethanol plan, and then um, uh, with the really moderate, moderate, very conservative assumptions, and then added in the orange vehicles here on this, uh, on this bar, which is uh, somewhat dedicated, high octane, low carbon fuel standard vehicles, we would, um, we, we are absolutely comparable with the, uh, that aggressive proposed rule by the Biden administration in uh, greenhouse gas uh, savings. Um, you know, so, so in summary, obviously electric vehicles and biofuels vehicles, um, you know, safe, safe greenhouse gas emissions. This is a greenhouse gas panel, so I'm only talking about um, greenhouse gases. But really, for electric vehicles, our modeling needs to improve. Our, our scrutiny, I should say, the, the overall scrutiny that science places on these models need to definitely, definitely uh, improve, right? We need to understand more the seasonality, the regionality of it. How do they really perform in northern cold, northern climate, right, on average? We need to understand marginal versus average uh, power plant dispatch, right? When do we really charge those vehicles? And what will it take for us to do, you know, move the load around, do time, time of use charging? All of those programs are not, not uh, cheap to administer. Um, and so we need to figure all of this into account in the, in, into the cost of uh, um, of, an, of an electric vehicle. And uh, uh, driving modes matter, right? City driving, a lot of, you know, a lot in the United States is rural driving patterns, and that matters, right? The, the, the benefits of an EV vehicle in rural driving a areas are, are much, much lower than, than the short distance city driving. And uh, all of this needs to uh, be incorporated into updated models, and scientists need to place more scrutiny on that. And finally, we got to keep going on the ethanol research um, as well. Uh, you know, if we put ethanol into dedicated vehicles, uh, into dedicated um, high octane, low carbon fuel uh, vehicle with optimized engines, then we have to create, um, you know, its own, own separate bucket of an energy economy ratio similar to the way it's done in California for electric vehicles to get you know, efficiency benefits uh, for, for these specific vehicles, we need to create that bucket for, um, for our uh, high octane, low carbon fuels uh, as well. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Yep, we're on. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so we have about 20 minutes left uh, of, our, of our panel up here. Again, if you guys have some questions, we'd love to hear from you. Things that are on your mind, uh, just go ahead and approach the microphone and um, we, can start, we can start there. We've got one over there. And again, we may address it to, to one of the folks on the panel or we could just open it up for conversation. But we'll go ahead and uh, hear the first question. Hi, good morning. I'm in obstructed view here, but... Uh... My name is John Norwood, and by disclosure, I'm a small uh, investor in Renewable Energy Group, but I wanted to uh, ask a question tied into some of the remarks that Dave and Jessica gave. Dave, Dave talked about the importance of getting started now. Jessica talked about the importance of trying to lower the energy footprint. And as I think about Iowa, how do these systems work together? One of the systems I think we need to think really carefully about, I've been here for 20 years and we don't seem to think a lot about it, which is our uh, animal production, particularly our swine. We produce over 30% of the nation's pork, over 50 million animals per year. And those animals, that all that manure sitting beneath many of these barns is percolating and it's a large em emitter of uh, methane. So let's think about how we take that methane. It's not easy, it's 95% water, the manure, and it's all distributed. But we gotta think about if we're spending three, four billion dollars to, to build carbon pipelines to take carbon and pump it into the uh, bedrock versus 
maybe putting it back in the soil, which is what uh, Marshall was talking about. I think we need to do that. But let's, let's get that methane. That's 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It, and it's an annuity. It, it, to your point, Dave, it keeps going. And so that's my, my thought, my comment, and I'd, I'd take any commentary as to whether we think that's a good idea. And if so, how, how might we move, move forward? Maybe that's what some of the Biden money should be directed towards. Let's, let's, let's collect that manure and process it. And it's all sorts of other good benefits, path, pathogen control, odor control, more efficient nutrients, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll go first in response. Thank you for the comments and the questions. I'll keep it brief, because I'm sure Dave has some comments as well. I agree. I think that uh, these solutions for getting at uh, more efficient energy consumption and reducing carbon scores is not a one-size-fits-all uh, type of solution environment. I think that we as ethanol producers need to take a good hard look at our local landscapes and our local communities and find out who we can partner with, where it makes sense, and really look at these items as resources in our backyards and make it work for us. Now here, where you have a large presence of hog producers, your proposal of utilizing that manure in that way makes a heck of a lot of sense to me. In other regions in the country, there's going to be some other locally sourced uh, energy resource that needs to be tapped into, and we really need to be taking a good hard look at those options and creating opportunities around them. Dave? Yeah, so, so I think the bio, we'll call that biogas, so it's the renewable methane or natural gas, um, is, is a really good opportunity to do two things, as you mentioned, John. First of all, you're avoiding an emission because that methane otherwise would go up in the atmosphere and have a, and it's a greenhouse gas as well. It also gives you a renewable energy source that can be used for a variety of things, whether it's heating your, your, sit, your facility, whether it's turning into methanol to make biodiesel, whether it's finding a way to, to utilize in some other way. So I think you're correct. That those are the kind of small but distributed steps we can take. Funny. There's always challenges with scale. I mean, how big does a facility need to be to be able to afford to put in a methane capture system? But yeah, those are exactly the kind of things we need to do. And then the other thing we need to do is the farmer, and therefore the biofuel that eventually is produced from that pig fat or from the corn facility, that eat, the pigs that eat the corn, the biofuel needs to get credit for having yet a lower carbon footprint than people said before. So it's all about accounting for this as well. Can I say something as well? Um, John, thank you for the question. Yeah, I. I, um, I just want to put a plug in for some work some colleagues of mine are doing at Iowa State. So we were awarded a, a $10 million grant to do uh, what's been shortened to grass to gas. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore, is leading this effort. And we're looking at the whole uh, cycle, on farm, everything, energy production of this biogas. And not only that, I'm getting involved in some projects since my specialty is in soil fertility of using the, what's called the digestate after that gas production. And a, a farmer named Brian Sievers is uh, already starting to apply some of that on his farm and we're seeing many soil health benefits to that already. Cool, already have some activity around that. That's great to hear. We have another question. Yes. Good morning. My name is Warren Pitcher. I'm an investor and a proud investor in Lincoln Way Energy in Nevada. And this whole electric car business has kind of uh, got me a little concerned. But one thing, and this might be uh, Dr. Mueller, I'll direct it to him. They don't seem to give any kind of an indication on electric charging what it will be the cost per mile if you're using the electrical energy, and also the total cost of operating a vehicle. I think the federal government right now pays 58 cents a mile when you're considering more than just your, your fuel. And, and like I say, I know the uh, replacement of electric batteries <laughs> Uh, the general public doesn't seem to hear much about that. Now, maybe you're fortunate enough to trade cars before you need a brand new battery. But I just feel that the, the, they're not willing to share, at least what I read and see, what's it going to cost me 
per mile just for my electric charge and what is the true cost say that I, uh, I drive 25,000 miles a year and uh, don't have a lot of time to wait in line to get my vehicle charged get, and, and any of the other panel members that'd like to address that thank you thank you Warren yeah I can I can, can you? I can uh, briefly uh, speak to this yeah so so you're exactly right I think there's big differences between what the models show on paper um, because they show right you have you know electricity is relatively cheaper on a, on a per energy unit than you know liquid fuel uh, but really that does only tell half of the story right there's maintenance costs there's weight issues to the car um, as we say the batteries have to be uh, replaced uh, they, you know they deteriorate deteriorate um, over time and so I think we, we're reading all these all these issues that we are getting in um, with with electric vehicles more on blocks right electric vehicle owners blocks um, if, if you read those I think they give you a pretty good picture by now on what it takes to have an electric vehicle uh, throughout the year but but I would agree with you uh, that the general models that that we are seeing do not probably reflect the true cost of ownership of these vehicles Chris, I'll jump in on that too. Um, the study I referenced um, during my remarks out of Detroit, it was a guy who bought, a, bought an EV. He's an EV enthusiast, but he set about to say, what's it take? And you know, he goes, you actually have to use commercial chargers a lot more than home chargers, and you deadhead a lot. And so he, you know, he did this report, and that's you know, analysis, and when you actually factor in the real world aspects of it, you, know, you, don't, you don't really save money. Uh, it, it, he, he would argue. So yeah. I, I also have a question if you'll let me have one. We'll give it to you, Monty. So, so far I think the quote of the day, and it's painful for me to admit it wasn't mine, uh, is from Dave. Um, ILUC is not indirect land use change, it's imaginary land use change. I'm totally <laughs> stealing that and I'm not going to give you credit. Um, but along those lines, you know, I, I pointed out, I mean, biofuels have been under a microscope. Everything, including imaginary land use change, goes into our theoretical carbon footprint. And meanwhile, we ignore all this stuff on the EV side. Um, doc, so I don't know whether this is to Dave or Dr. Mueller, but you mentioned, I've always been thinking, well, wait, we get this indirect land use penalty. Well, we are slowly phasing out coal power plants. And, you know, that is good when, you know, from a greenhouse gas standpoint, when you replace that with natural gas or whatever. But if all of a sudden we double, which is what it would take, to electrify our transportation, just light duty, it we double the amount of demand on the grid, are we not going to have coal-fired power plants running harder and for many more years than they would otherwise? And is that indirect, yeah. I don't know, it's not land use, in indirect coal plant use penalty, something that anyone's looking at? I've always been curious. Yeah. So, so that, I mean, this is, this is a very good question, right? So we're facing out um, coal, but we're also facing out a lot of nuclear assets right now, which are low-carbon assets. I think um, as of January of last year, we were supposed to phase out five gigawatts of, uh, of nuclear power resources. That's still, that's been uh, scaled down uh, because now some of the Illinois reactors uh, are online, but the, eventually they're going to phase them out, pr probably, and it's going to create, you know, deep holes of low-carbon electricity that have to be made up, and they're going to be made up, um, you know, with solar and wind, uh, but then they have to be balanced out too, right? Because you have wind blowing at night, early night, and, and, and solar during the day uh, working. And so then you have to build peaking power plant with natural gas to, to balance them out or large battery packs. And so it creates imbalances. And all of this, right, is, uh, you know, not, not as mentioned in those studies. If you look at all the optimistic electric vehicle studies, they simply assume we're phasing out coal and we're gonna have a renewable grid, everybody just like California. And I do think this is very unrealistic uh, in, 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 in my point of view. Again, there needs to be much more scrutiny placed on that, on these studies that come out. And, and people need to respond to them and say, hey, how can this assumption be true? This is, this is not realistic. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, I apologize up front for not having an EV question, but uh, I want to ask, uh, particularly uh, Professor McDaniel, uh, what have you guys seen at Iowa State when it comes to modeling about the amount of greenhouse gas reductions that can be had in uh, corn production? And uh, with your focus on soil, uh, soil carbon, I'm wondering also how much carbon can actually be put 
into the soil because we hear all these carbon credit companies now, you know, offering two, three tons an acre if you use their biologic or something like that. But realistically, what actually uh, can be can be shown in these carbon sequestration studies, et cetera. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. What was your name again? Apologize, Chris Clayton. I'm with DT and the Progressive Farmer. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate the question. Yeah, so in short, um, I, I always want to defer to my typical question or my typical answer to a question like this is it's complicated, right? So the, the models um, out there, I think, are OK. They're, they're not as, as a scientist, we always want to improve them. Um, my study I showed you, so we, that, that data that I showed you, Chris, um, was from 11 independent studies. It's also known as a meta-analysis. So each one of those bars I showed you had uh, several data points underlying it. I just showed a, a simplified bar. And by our estimation, from those studies, we have about a 50% um, deficit, meaning we could about double the carbon we have now, according to those figures. Now, I have to put a caveat on that. Again, it's complicated, because what has resulted in that decline in soil organic matter over soil carbon for in, in that 200, 300 years since uh, we've tilled the soils here in the United States and, and tile drained them. So we, we, we even don't know the ultimate sources of that depletion of soil organic matter. We know it's a combination of these things, tillage and erosion, uh, um, tile drainage, which aerated the soil, which is actually good for production, but we think it also accelerates organic matter mineralization, releasing that carbon to CO2. However, to turn it around, like you said, I mentioned some of those management practices. So some of the most promising are no-till, cover crops, combinations of those. Uh, we know manure works. Um, and whether or not we'll, we'll double, um, it's, it's, it's highly optimistic, but um, I, I'm a little bit skeptical myself. But there's a lot of important things that kind of figure into that. I hope I got to your question. I think he walked away from the mic, though. Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, this question is for Dr. Mueller. On your EV uh, grams of carbon per mile, does that include a life cycle assessment of the batteries, or is that a separate number? And if so, do you happen to know what that number would be on average? Oh, I'm out. So this is just the, the number for operating it, right? Operating a, uh, a natural gas, uh, the gasoline vehicles versus, um, versus electric vehicles uh, during the year. It does not include the manufacture um, of, of the vehicle. Um, some of the numbers I've seen, it's probably uh, the manufacture of a vehicle is, is probably equivalent to operating it two to three years, um, you know, of operation of a vehicle is, is about the same as the upfront uh, emissions to build that car. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, I have one for Jessica. Um, we talked a little bit about plant uh, plant technologies and projects. You mentioned cogen. You also mentioned carbon capture. Um, in your opinion, could you just give us a little bit more? Uh, you know, uh, of your experience there, what you think uh, is, is beneficial, and then what you see um, plants looking at, you know, in the, in the immediate future. I mean, obviously, we've got some pipeline uh, sponsors here. Monty talked about that earlier. Um, but I think there's also, you know, you mentioned the code gen, but there's also some uh, other big capital projects um, that have the potential to drive our carbon score lower. Well, Chris. Um, I think that current technology providers are probably reaching out to producers one-on-one -on -one more so than I'm seeing directly in a public sphere. So I don't have any you know, tangible examples to share. But when we are evaluating these different opportunities that are presented to us, I think that we really want to keep in mind and keep in focus the feasibility of those opportunities and also, again, 
we can't get into a mindset of trying to find the silver bullet that's going to be available for everybody in the long term without also keeping in focus what we have available to us today and utilizing those resources in the most efficient way possible that we have today. So whether that's renewable natural gas or biogas access, whether that's solar or wind, uh, electricity or other alternative forms of electricity used and consumed as electricity or being converted to process heat or other things that I simply cannot even imagine yet today. Um, we need to keep those things in mind and try our very best to keep uh, some simple principles and practices in scope when we review that. Thank you. We got another question at the mic? <coughs> yes. Um, my name is Rafael Thies from, from Germany. I'm general manager of Creek and Fisher Engineers. Um, we do engineering for biogas plants, so obviously I would like to come back to this biogas topic. Um, it sounded a little bit like there's a lot of research and development necessary for, for biogas plants. Um, to give you some numbers, in Germany we have 10,000 biogas plants um, with an electric pill capacity of uh, 5 gigawatts, so we are already replacing five nuclear power plants, 46,000 people are working in the biogas industry. And uh, Creek and Fisher, we designed the biogas plant for an ethanol plant um, four years ago in Argentina. So um, we are using the thin stillage there for biogas production. We burn the biogas in a CHP, producing electricity for the electricity consumption in the ethanol plant, producing heat. It can be used in the ethanol plant. So there is a significant reduction of fossil um, energies possible with very simple measures in-house. Um, I mean, you are we're talking about renewable fuels. That is your job, that's your business here with ethanol, with biodiesel. There's another renewable fuel that you can easily produce from the organics you already have, and that is, that is really biogas. Um, and it would be very interesting to know the carbon footprint per, per mile when you reduce um, carbon intensity by producing biogas on site. So I think then you would be very much below the California standard EV. And then it's really getting interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great comment. Anybody have experience with, with biogas on a, on a carbon intensity score? Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, we've done similar calculations in other areas. I mean, it could, it could conceivably be um, negative for um, you know, for, for, an, for, for an electric vehicle if you use that, uh, that biogas or, or for a plug-in in hybrid, right? So there are, there are, um, there are um, obvious advantages there in, in using biogas to electricity generated yeah, electricity. Uh, but we also have to be, you know, another, another thing we really have to be careful do down the road is we have, really have to look carefully at at renewable, uh, at renewable portfolio standards, right, that, that are going to be heavily based only on wind and natural gas, uh, on, on wind and solar, and ignore natural gas resources um, as well, and these digester to electricity uh, uh, f facilities, and not give them renewable energy credits um, as well. So I think like it's a whole, it's a whole push we have to do. Uh, not we, I mean, I think the, the industry has to do now into really, really closely looking also at renewable portfolio standards, you know, do they provide enough electricity for all these EVs that are, that, that are coming out? Are they going to be way too expensive uh, if they mandate only solar and wind, right? Is this really feasible? Where will electricity rates go under renewable portfolio standards if we only rely uh, on, on, on wind and solar? I, I have a big, a big concern there. There's got to be a role of combined heating power. Um, there's got to be a role for digesters, for agricultural digester generated electricity and other efficient uh, uh, generating uh, resources. Uh, but there will be a cost increase that will be borne uh, by by the ratepayer, by the ratepayer, and that'll be an implicit subsidy um, that will not be attributed to electric vehicles. So that's another one of my fears here. That's not properly accounted for. 
We have just a minute. You have a, you want one more follow up there? Just a quick comment. I, I think Dave's point about accounting and packaging is super critical. We start talking about the biogas. I think Matt, you mentioned the digestate. Now that goes back onto the soil. Maybe that has a positive impact on soil health and the carbon capture. We got to figure that out. We got to package it in a way that people can understand. Monty talked about the, the imaginary land use. I, I, th I think we have to think about how do we thoughtfully package all of the d different pieces of the system and say this is what you get when you deliver the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that comment. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you all for your questions today. This has been a, a good conversation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.